Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor for Shadowproof, and welcome to the Dissenter Weekly for March 11th, 2021. Before we get rolling on our whistleblower stories for the week, Brian has a few things for you. Hello, everyone. Good to be with you again, and you as well, Kevin, of course. Happy belated birthday uh, to oh, Kevin. You. I have to throw that out there and embarrass you for a second, but uh, very grateful to be working with you, so just wanted to celebrate you. Um, um, anyway, I just wanted to um, remind everybody to follow us uh, wherever you're watching, whether that's on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, and make sure that you, um, oh, if you want to support the show and you want to make sure that Kevin can continue doing this work, if you want to make sure that we can keep publishing work from freelancers, uh, you can go over to shadowproof.com slash donate, and we have a bunch of options there. <clears throat> you can also check out Kevin's newsletter, uh, which is at the dissenter.substack.com, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, throughout the show, but probably at the end. Um, so with that, let's jump into some of our stories here. Um, a really terrible one to begin here with. The Congolese whistleblowers sentenced to death in absentia. We talked about this story, I think, on our last episode. Um, what is yeah. this update you have here? This is So uh, we talked about both of these uh, courageous people. Um, the uh, Their names are, just to get them in front of me here, apologize for not having that handy, but uh, Navy Malela and Grady Coco are the two uh, uh, whistleblowers from the De Democratic Republic of the Congo who are no longer in DRC. They're living somewhere in, in Europe. Um, and uh, I believe it might be, um, it, it may, they may be in Paris. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where they are, but they are uh, not there. So they're not in immediate danger, but their own government from the country where they you know they were citizens has sentenced them to death in absentia for their whistleblowing. Um, and as is laid out in this press release from this group, PPLAAF, which is the platform to protect whistleblowers in Africa, uh, they have uh, have laid out what they, they believe is going on. Um, and uh, both of them were bankers at the Afriland First Bank, and they uh, were they were uh, contributors to a, a report that looked at sanctions um, and the way that there was this uh, money laundering network that was set up, in which the bank there was apparently facilitating and helping businessmen um, and, and people tied to the resource and mineral trade who were uh, seeking to get around sanctions from the U.S. Treasury Department, in particular, one businessman named Dan Gertler, who is from uh, Israel, who has the support of a, a, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, um, who was under sanctions, and then at the end of the Trump administration, the the Trump administration's uh, the Treasury under Trump decided to give him a special pass for one year, where those sanctions were lifted, so that he no longer um, had to uh, 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 go through having these restrictions that were, get, you know, providing some impairment to his ability to exploit the the resources of the DRC and uh, he has a history of being involved in the conflict diamond trade or the blood diamond trade as it sometimes um, referred uh, came uh, in his in his early career as a oligarch which I think by definition of his power within the Congo he is one uh, they he wanted to develop a business that could compete with De Beers which is this diamond company that has its roots in the colonial history of South Africa and the apartheid history of South Africa. And so this is a story that touches on a lot of issues um, and uh, colonialism in particular. And so uh, both of these men at great risk themselves contributing information about the way in which business people were uh, circumventing sanctions and it, comes out that 
uh, as as laid out by PPL AAF, the there's been retaliatory acts uh, and the attacks have reached a climax where there's a death sentence that has been imposed. Like I said, we, we, we heard chatter. This wasn't confirmed. When we talked about the story last week, uh, I noted it, but it was not confirmed. So it seemed rather absurd. And um, I think that's why calling it a farcical process, now oftentimes we can abuse it and call things a farce. But I think it absolutely fits here in this instance because it doesn't seem clear at all why they would um, be sentenced to death. As in nobody was killed, um, you know, oftentimes when you think of, you know, as, as much as Brian and myself are opposed to the death penalty, if somebody is facing uh, a death sentence, you can typically see some evidence or talk in the narrative of the crime that suggests they were involved in some kind of violent act that, 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 that requires <laughs> sentencing somebody to death. You know, here we're just talking about information at a bank that it, um, they released uh, without authorization that exposed corruption and, and, and the DRC um, has apparently decided to enter these death sentences into the record, which is extremely troubling. Uh, they have um, uh, basically gone, in addition to that, to intimidating and threatening journalists and NGOs, according to PPLAAF, and they're spreading false information on social networks about what went on. So the director for this organization condemns uh, these methods, which aim to impede freedom of expression and suppress the voices of those fighting corruption in the DRC and elsewhere. The obvious aim, according to Henry Dulies, is to prevent Congolese and international public opinion from having access to tangible information about the actions of those who, through their systematic predation, plunder Congo's resources. So that, that's exactly why um, they were sentenced at a fraudulent trial. And uh, there's, you know, they weren't there. They didn't get to put forward a defense. Um, and so this was all done in secret at the behest of whatever colonial interests are driving the government, which are completely known to the uh, administration of President Joe Biden. Uh, the Treasury Department would be well aware of these issues because they sanctioned Dan Gertler. Um, things that they have said about the way in which the DRC is arranged and how uh, 70 to 80 percent of the people live in extreme poverty in the Congo and do not actually share in the wealth that is derived from these minerals. Um, particularly, you know, coltan has been something that has received a lot of attention because it's in our iPhones. Um, and so um, all of this is uh, very disturbing and the, it's an attack on journalism as well as, as whistleblowing uh, because they contributed to this report that gave us more information about this uh, systemic problem. Um, and so we'll have to keep track of them. Fortunately, they are in exile, and so they're not under immediate danger, it would seem. They're not likely um, to be taken into custody uh, I don't expect the DRC to have the ability to force their extradition, uh, but for now, uh, you know, we just wish there's some way that these can be retracted through public pressure so that they are no longer facing these death sentences that are hanging over their heads. I mean, obviously it means, I don't know if they were ever intending to return, but this definitely means now that they can't go back to mm -hmm. the DRC, which is their home. Thank you, Kevin. We will definitely keep an eye on this story um, and, and keep bringing attention to it. So appreciate that. Um, let's move on here to our next story. We have whistleblowers urge the U.S. government to prosecute, prosecute Credit Suisse for helping the wealthy dodge taxes. Uh, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this 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 fits into a lot of uh, progressive ideas out there that uh, the we should tax the rich and the, the rich aren't paying their fair share. So this, this, this goes uh, very well, uh, especially with our politics. Um, and we've had a month now of resistance from people who are in the moneyed class to raising the wage for people at the bottom. 
So you have these Credit Suisse bankers who have blown the whistle on their employer. Um, some of them have received rewards already for exposing tax dodging, uh, but they're saying that there's an undisclosed $200 million in which the U.S. government should go after and they should punish Credit Suisse. Um, and it should be beyond, there should be punishment beyond a $2.6 billion uh, penalty that was assessed as part of a guilty plea seven years ago. This is from Bloomberg or Bloomberg Law, more specifically. Uh, a lawyer for the bankers wrote a letter to the IRS's whistleblower office last week, according to the story that says that the bank is, in, is continuing a conspiracy well after they entered this plea agreement back in 2014. They've been omitting details, so they're covering up what's going on. Um, and, uh, um, and eventually it says, it points out that they're penalty was reduced from 2.6 billion to 1.3 billion. Um, and I think that fuels the rage among these whistleblowers who believe that there should be something more done to this bank who, as they're pointing out, continue to engage in this conduct. So uh, they're hopeful, uh, well, not hopeful, but they would like Credit Suisse to be held accountable and found in violation of their plea agreement and there should be additional penalties. So the, the whistleblowers believe that they are actually not abiding by the terms of this agreement, which they pled guilty. So there should be new charges against the bank and or the U.S. might want to revoke or suspend their license to operate within the, US, uh, the United States. And so uh, this goes back to May 2014. According to the story, I'll read for you what they were accused of doing exactly. They were helping Americans use sham companies. There were foundations and trusts that were being set up to hide money from U.S. tax authorities. And by the way, let me connect this to the previous story because this actually goes with what the Afriland First Bank whistleblowers were exposing. This is the exact same kind of corruption that they were bringing to the attention of the U.S. Treasury Department and others around the world by revealing that there were these you know, different measures that were being taken by businessmen who used their bank. So at the time, the bank did not tell the Justice Department about this $200 million account that was held by an American client. His name is Dan Horsky. Um, I apologize if that's somebody who is a notable or influential figure. Um, I'll have to look him up after the show and maybe in a follow-up further along the way I'll uh, fill in some additional detail about who that is and how he comes to have $200 million that he can just ship around. But uh, the whistleblowers um, told the U.S. two months later about this account, and uh, when Credit Suisse was sentenced, the judge knew nothing about this account and this, this additional money. So this money should have been factored into the guilty sentence, and yet it was not. And so I think core core issue here is that Credit Suisse has been engaged in corrupt conduct, uh, been involved in dirty money um, and uh, dirty money schemes, and yet they have not been held accountable fully, even though they were taken to trial. So uh, the whistleblowers would like further action are demanding further action from. The, uh, the Justice Department, or if not the Justice Department, the IRS to step in and specifically get involved. Thank you, Kevin. Um, in New Jersey, we have Amazon settling a whistleblower lawsuit over lack of COVID-19 safety. Uh, what is the story here? This story, just so we're clear with everyone who's following along, is not the Christian Smales Amazon story that uh, is in New York. This one is in New Jersey uh, for international audience, bordering state. Uh, and so this is just a, uh, a stipulation uh, to, to a settlement. We don't really know the terms. It's not even really clear the amount. This is the way it works with corporate America. Um, they get to offer some, some money to, uh, his name is David J. Bailey who was involved in safety measures at Amazon, and uh, then they get to just move on um, uh, and, and the wash their hands of having to deal with this lawsuit. So uh, 
Bailey was fired in August during 2020 after he complained uh, to a person named Christopher Lauderdale. Um, and he complained uh, that this person, I assume it was a coworker who had refused to keep at least a six foot distance from other workers. And then Bailey said in his suit, he realized the company was operating its business, quote, unlawfully on a sustained and continued basis with, um, with regard, without regard to enforcing safety laws, re regulations uh, surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. The plaintiff, um, who is Bailey, um, also discovered that this individual named Lauderdale had been reported several times by several employees for violations of laws and regulations, but human resources ignored or refused to pass the complaints on to upper management. So uh, this, I imagine, well, would have been filed in August, uh, you know, the early months of this pandemic from March to, to August featured a lot of these kinds of whistleblower complaints that were filed. And, uh, and so uh, this was done under New Jersey's Conscientious Employee Protection Act. Uh, and then being that uh, they settled, I don't know for certain, but I think it's a fair thing to say that this person who blew the whistle against Amazon likely had grounds for a lawsuit. And so Amazon settled rather than have uh, a trial or open hearing in which they could, uh, people could find out more details about how they weren't protecting their workers. But we know it was systematically happening because we've heard from facility to facility in the US that there was a pretty, pretty flagrant disregard, at least in the first part of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Thank you, Kevin. Um, another important story, especially as Amazon workers are uh, attempting to unionize uh, right. in other parts of the country. Um, let's move on to our next story here. We have whistleblowers are accusing the Trump Department of Justice of politicizing staff hiring during the final days in office. Kevin, I cannot believe that. What is the story here? That sounds completely like something that would never happen uh, in our government. Tell us a little Politic bit about this story politicizing a department when you're no longer going to be in office. Ha, how dare you try to impose people who wouldn't fit the next administration? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we've had evidence. We covered one story. This reminds me of the one story we covered where they tried to ink a deal with the Immigration and Custom Enforcement uh, Union in order to establish some kind of a bargaining agreement where there were certain policies related to immigration that Biden wouldn't be able to consider unless he got the support of the union. And uh, the DHS secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, ended up saying, well, that's not legit. We're not going to recognize this deal and has tossed it aside and, and said it was done unfairly. Um, and so I, I put this in the same bucket as that, because as you're going to hear in the few details that, that we share in, the, in highlighting the story, it's gotten some pretty good coverage. Uh, it's, you know, if it's the Trump scandal, so there's a whistleblower stories that make it into our media, CNN.com published story. Um, you know, this is going to be a feature of Joe Biden. Any kinds of whistleblower stories we get about Trump, uh, they're going to want to remind us about how evil and bad Donald Trump was. Um, and rather than focus on what's presently happening with the Biden administration. Um, and I, I say that as someone who feels like we could cover both. I think we can give attention to both Trump scandals and anything corrupt that Biden's administration would be engaged in doing. But for them, it's it's an either or because it's easier for them to hate Donald Trump than it is to hold Joe Biden's feet to the fire, as the cliche goes. So this individual is Jeffrey Bossert Clark, who's accused of politicizing the hiring process before he left the Justice Department. And uh, they, this, this is said to have happened in elevating an employee who is seen as loyal to Trump. And, and now I will share some of the details about this person. 
and why this you know this is rep reprehensible and i think we can agree to that uh he clark was accused of improperly intervening in a, a kind of promotion process that's supposed to go on this happened in january 12th allegedly according to these whistleblowers and again just to give credit where credit is due this is something that the government accountability project is involved in and they continue to uh, put uh, give a platform for federal whistleblowers. And so um, the idea was, uh, so staff were informed that Mr. Clark had appointed as a uh, CIV assistant director, um, an individual with significantly less experience and achievements than other uh, passed over candidates. What set the successful appointee apart from the other candidates was that the appointee, unlike the others, had volunteered as part of the DOJ's litigation team defending a controversial Trump administration policy. This policy barred pregnant, unaccompanied minors in federal immigration custody from obtaining abortions. And I can stop there. There's really no much, there's not much more that I need to tell you about what's going on here. That's the most important detail and why this is something that has to be undone. Um, and, you know, obviously it seems like with this coming forward and coming out, um, you know, that person is not going to have the ability to push this kind of a destructive policy unless it's something Joe Biden's administration chooses to embrace. But I don't really see why they would do that because then that would make their immigration policy toxic and they're trying to sanitize it without completely abandoning the idea of having a virtual wall on the border and having uh, deportation centers or, or, or facilities that hold migrants. And so uh, this, this, is some, this is a step too far. I mean, this is not something that is accepted within the political, among political elites. And, and so uh, this is uh, it's good that whistleblowers are, are speaking out and bringing, bringing this person to people's attention so that they are not in a position of influence to um, make this something that I guess the Justice Department would enforce or, or advance through its work as it connects to immigration. Thank you, Kev. Um, before we wrap up, we wanted to give an update uh, on what's going on with Julian Assange. What information do you have for us this week? Yes. So I have an update from the crowd justice fundraiser that is still ongoing. Actually, it looks like they're just a, uh, a few hundred pounds away from their goal. They received 1600 from people. This is something I've kept tabs on, though, because Stella Morris, who is Julian Assange's partner, has been providing updates about where the legal team is at as far as the case goes. And in addition to her sharing um, updates about the state of prisons in uh, the United Kingdom, um, I saw something a little dis disturbing about how in the last day or 48 hours, there were 20 people who were found dead. Um, and they believe that it was from COVID, which is troubling, especially knowing that Julian Assange is still in Belmarsh prison. There's been some questions about how well he's being taken care of and prevented from uh, and protected from spread all throughout the past year of this pandemic. By his lawyers, um, we are told in this update on March 8th, have prepared submissions that will counter uh, application to appeal the magistrate court's decision from January 4th. Uh, we also learn in this update that in Australia, there is the, the leader of the main opposition party, Anthony Albanese, is now calling for Assange to be freed. And then in the US, we have the confirmation of Attorney General Merrick Garland. And what that means now is this is uh, a key moment for us to force a different direction within the Justice Department. It's, it's time for the pressure campaign to kick into overdrive. It's time for Merrick Garland to become familiarized with what happened internally with the Trump administration in this case, to look at what happened with this case under President Obama, and to make a choice because there were two distinct paths. And you've heard this repeated before, but I'll repeat it again. 
Donald Trump's decided to issue an indictment with charges against Julian Assange for conduct, for the publication of information, and for alleged acts that he was involved in back in 2010. The same conduct was available for Eric Holder's Justice Department under President Obama. They could have charged Julian Assange. And they chose not to, and we know why, because they didn't want to take the step that would endanger freedom of the press and make it possible for the Justice Department to now bring cases against editors of papers, news producers at media outlets or cable news, you know, you name it, it would have opened it up to potential of other people in the press being prosecuted. And so they away. And they left it at only prosecuting the source, PFC Chelsea Manning. And so now, um, and, and as, as articulated by Stella, Garland faces a choice, whether to continue the Trump administration's war on the press or defend the integrity of the U.S. Constitution. It's that basic. The entire world is watching uh, within Europe, in the U.K. especially, but also in Australia and in the global south in South America and in African countries that have benefited from the publications done by WikiLeaks. They are watching the United States to see what they choose to do, uh, whether the Justice Department under Merrick Garland decides to embrace going forward and prosecuting a, a person who is a journalist. Uh, it's going to send a signal to other countries as to what they can get away with under uh, Joe Biden and his uh, um, government over the United States, and uh, it'll send a signal to other countries as to what is acceptable. And to some degree, they've already been shown that it could be acceptable to prosecute a journalist. And so we've lost some credibility as a country when it comes to criticizing other places that mistreat and abuse journalists. Uh, but you know, I suppose if we're going to you know, just say, you know, at least they haven't murdered him yet. So, you know, at least we could say the U.S. is in Saudi Arabia and they're not plotting to, uh, and they're not actually going in with a bone saw and killing Julian Assange. But, you know, we have evidence from UC Global that they were talking about conspiracies to kidnap um, and to poison him. And uh, they wanted to ID his babies and they were doing all kinds of things that, uh, I could tell you if Saudi Arabia was doing it, we would be really outraged. Uh, at least like all of civil society in the U.S. would be terribly outraged to learn that that was being done. And so, uh, you know, I, th I think that, you know, where this is, is, is pretty troubling on its own. And we, we don't want it to advance any further and become even more profoundly disturbing than it already is for uh, standards of press freedom in the United States. So there, it's mentioned that there was a U.S. prosecutor who's outgoing, Zachary Terwilliger, who had talked about how there was division within the ranks, that some people within the Justice Department who are career prosecutors or just personnel there that are going to work administration to administration had disagreement about whether to charge uh, Julian Assange or whether it was a good use of DOJ resources and funds to go after Julian Assange. And uh, I'm sure that'll, you know, that'll come into play. You know, ultimately, I think for people who are supporters, they just want to see the charges dropped. And whatever excuse they have to give to abandon and drop the charges. I mean, it's not like people have much faith in Biden anyway. And it's not like they feel any of the people in the administration are going to stand on principle when it comes to Assange. So if they have to just decide they don't want to waste money in the budget on Assange and that's how they abandon the case, I mean, I think that's going to be acceptable to people, especially Stella and his two children who would just like him to come home so he can be with his family and no longer be vulnerable to the pandemic, to, to the virus and, uh, is no longer deteriorating inside of a, a cell due to his mental health. Thank you, Kevin, for that update. Um, 
how do we want to wrap this up here? Do you want to talk a little bit um, about the article that we published by Ella Fassler this week? Do you want to go into first yeah. your plans with the the, the um, newsletter this week uh, coming? Well, week? Let's let. Well, let's hit the let's hit the newsletter for oh sorry let's hit your uh, the the which you worked on let's hit okay. the Ella Fassler story which fits our show it's about somebody who uh, though they were a journalist uh, we could slide them in as a whistleblower as well uh, I don't I don't want to take it away I mean truly it it, it was no journal- it's a little complex so it's, I it's, totally it's agree. a little bit of both yeah. a little bit of column right. A a little bit of column B. Right. And uh, so uh, why don't you give the details and if there's other things I want to like, out and get into, um, we can, we can, uh, we can raise those, but, but I think it's a good part of our show just to, and I'm going to, while you're talking, I'm going to put the story on the screen. So okay. people can see. Cool. Yeah. So we published a piece this week. Uh, it's up at Shatterproof now. It's called uh, journalists detained at geo group halfway house faces retaliation for exposing a COVID-19 outbreak. Um, Some of you who have been following our work may have seen that over the past year, obviously like many other places we've been covering the pandemic with special attention to prisons and other areas of the criminal justice system, um, being that they are prime points of infection uh, throughout the country. Um, Prisons and other detention centers are often places where you see infection at rates uh, that far outpace pretty much anywhere else in the state. Um, so Ella has a great piece here. I don't want to give too many details because I actually would love for folks to go read it. She did a really great job. Um, but Keith Malik Washington uh, was incarcerated in federal prison for 13 years. Um, when he was scheduled to get out this year, he requested home confinement from the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, but you know, unlike Paul Manafort or Michael Cohen, uh, he was not given home confinement. Um, And to be clear, you know, when people are uh, being released from prison, usually there's some sort of step down, right? So people don't always go straight to their home. Um, Sometimes they have home confinement uh, or home monitoring like this. Other times they have to go to halfway houses, which are sort of like, um, you know, supposedly they're supposed to be these intermediary places where people go and they can find work or they can have an address if, if they don't have a place to live yet. Um, it's supposed to be like a, a way to step out. So uh, at these halfway houses in the federal system, all of them are privatized. There's a wide variety in the federal system in terms of halfway houses and how they operate and how restrictive they are, but they're all private. And this one, um, like many of the halfway houses, is operated by a company called Geo Group, which you might recognize because Geo Group is one of the largest private prison companies uh, in the United States, if not probably at least in North America. Um, Geo Group has many divisions. They do immigrant detention. They do federal penitentiaries. Uh, they also operate um, private health care. But they also operate these uh, for incarcerated folks, but they also operate these halfway houses. Um, And predictably, just like the facilities that they run, the prisons, uh, the conditions are horrendous. Um, And predictably, COVID-19 spreads in in sort of the living conditions in which people are made to be there. They're not allowed to wear masks. They're living in close confinement because people are supposed to be finding work. They're coming and going from the halfway house, so they're not even quarantining inside. And um, so Keith Malik Washington, uh, on his way out of prison, was uh, hired as the editor-in-chief of a very uh, sort of legendary and well-known national Black newspaper called the San Francisco Bayview. So for many, many years, Mary Radcliffe was the editor-in-chief with uh, her partner, Willie, who was the publisher of the San Francisco Bayview newspaper. They're very wonderful people. I've had a chance to meet them when I lived uh, in the Bay. Um, They stepped down and Keith uh, Malik Washington took over. Now he's at this halfway house and there's a COVID outbreak. So he speaks to a journalist at um, uh, a local news outlet in San Francisco called 48 Hills. The journalist's name is Tim Redmond. Tells him about this outbreak that staff uh, and people are Um, testing positive. Redman, in his uh, pursuit of an article on this contacts geo group to ask them about this, 
she said she tried to deny the uh, Monica Hook, who's the uh, communications director for GeoCare, this division of Geo Group, told them there weren't any cases at this facility, uh, which is located in, in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Um, and then Redmond showed her the memo uh, that Geo Group had put out saying that people had tested positive and she backtracked. So uh, first, Malik, uh, Keith Malik Washington gets slapped um, with a disciplinary report for having unauthorized contact with the public. They take his phone away. They revoke his good time, which are like credits that allow you to get out earlier than you're supposed to. Um, so they're pushing his release date back. They're punishing him for that. Uh, he's barred from speaking to the media. And, uh, but Keith Malik Washington doesn't back down, right? He schedules a Zoom press conference and holds it and announces that he's going to file a lawsuit against both the Bureau of Prisons and Geo Group to get his cell phone back, to get his good time credits back, uh, and to, you know, work as a journalist and have basically enjoy his free speech. Um, and so the Bureau of Prisons then retaliates against him by charging him with escape, uh, which is, just mind boggling uh, because again, he's holding a news conference on zoom. He's not, he didn't leave without permission or go anywhere. Uh, he basically held a zoom press conference. And so they're trying to charge him with escape. There was a hearing uh, yesterday uh, with a federal judge. I do not have the info on where that uh, turned out or what the, if we know what the outcome of it was, um, that's something that we will definitely report back on. Um, but, you know, and I want to note throughout all of this that, again, he petitioned to be in home confinement because his family lives in San Francisco, but instead they're just arbitrarily forcing him to be in this halfway house. So they pretty much like kicked themselves in the ass on this, right? Like <laughs> he wanted to go home. <laughs> they, they made him uh, go to the halfway house. And so then he did what a journalist is supposed to do uh, and yep. blew the whistle. So, so that's the story. There's wonderful details. There's photos. Um, Ella spoke to Keith Malik Washington's fiance for the piece. It's fantastic. Uh, and I highly recommend you check it out uh, over at Shadowproof. Yeah. Yeah. We've got someone following who says they're punishing him for calling out their lies. Yes. Sounds familiar. I mean, yeah, that's uh, without reducing everything, without giving into overgeneralization that removes an interest that can remove an interest in the specifics of each individual story that is of importance that yes the theme that you find between almost all of these is that someone's being embarrassed and they don't like being embarrassed mm -hmm. so now they have to crush these people who have embarrassed them well it's interesting too because the bureau of prisons has a contract with geo group to do this and instead of looking at this and being like whoa maybe we should check out the conditions at this facility that we have contracted to carry out these duties, they decide to back them up by then uh, by then punishing them further. So it's like Geo, the Bureau of Prisons not only fails to conduct oversight on a contract that it is play, paying for with public money, uh, but then it doubles down on that failure to even provide oversight by joining in on the retaliation <laughs> against this person. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. You know, of course, uh, it is, you know, like, like uh, our friend here is saying, it is calling out their lies uh, and punishing him for it. But um, yeah, the whole relationship between uh, prisons and their contractors and the way that this dynamic works is always baffling to me because it would seem like what interest does the Bureau of Prisons have in not, you know, holding this contractor to account that embarrassed them? Uh, right. I mean, obviously, it's that they're all on the same side. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. So my newsletter. Yes. And then let's we can wrap up it. the. And thank you for that. That was a good yeah, wrap of, course. On, of, the, of that piece. And Ella Bassler is doing exceptional work. So. Uh, yes. And she's on Twitter. I encourage you to go find her and follow her reporting as a freelancer where she's published at multiple different outlets and doing you know, these kinds of stories on a regular basis. Yes. Uh, so this newsletter, uh, for those of you who do know about it, I hope that you're at least receiving a free newsletter for those of you who do not know and are watching this 
show for the first time. This is a weekly newsletter, a kind of companion to this show where I write about whistleblower stories, report on whistleblower stories, and there's a, a exclusive report that's written every week for those who do subscribe, occasionally maybe unlocked if it's on something that has received almost no attention at all. I mean, I noticed in the past week that there was no attention given to this work that was done by the Government Accountability Project and the International Bar Association on the state of whistleblower laws in 37 countries around the world. And so I decided to unlock it and share uh, also because I could tell that the organization, as they were trying to share my article uh, or share my coverage, they were sharing the show and not sharing the piece in which I did the, you know, a summary or reporting on what they had presented. And so I just thought, you know, it would be, uh, they would be more interested in sharing my report. Uh, and so I put that out there and uh, but a lot of times there's there's regular content for just people who are able to kick in some money and help keep this going. And the more of you that we are able to get to support the newsletter, the, the, the more work we'll be able to publish and the likelihood of bringing somebody additional on board will increase so that we can do this uh, newsletter and, and bring attention to these stories. And as of right now, um, sort of as a nod to um, be making another revolution around the sun, I have a discount, uh, an annual discount, a discount on the annual subscription of the newsletter of 33% uh, off of an annual subscription. And if you go there, you can uh, have that discount. So if you're monthly and want to kick it up to buying an annual subscription, I encourage you to do so. And periodically we'll offer these discounts so that we can expand the readership. Uh, so. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really have anything else to add beyond this. There's not a whole lot beyond what we covered. And uh, so uh, we'll just leave it where we are right now with yeah. everything and come back next week with more updates on. Yeah. And I see if you subscribe on Patreon through Shadowproof, that's a good way of uh, supporting us as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone out there who's supporting, who's giving uh, while you're watching today or otherwise or has been giving. Um, and definitely stay tuned. We have been working on some really cool stories that hopefully we can wrap up in the next uh, week or two here and share with you all. I'm really excited. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for listening. We continue to have oh, the perfect. Marvel Cook. Just, just to, I feel like every time we do this, we should at least say at the end, we still have the Marvel Cook Fellowship that we're doing and we're publishing those uh, stories, uh, which is a special way of, 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 of funding uh, journalism on abolition work that's done around prisons and policing. Yeah, we should have some cool ones coming, especially from, um, we're going to be publishing some from people who are currently incarcerated. So I'm especially excited uh, to publish that work. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone. Happy belated birthday once again to you, Kevin, uh, everybody <laughs> at well. home. You're welcome. Thank I, yes. I, I, I just, everyone's really kind. So thank you for the birthday wish. Yeah. Please. If you're at home watching right now, please, um, start singing happy birthday right now as we log off and just continue singing until you're, uh, until you're done for Kevin. Okay. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Have a good weekend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.